Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Eric, good to see you. Good to see you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's interesting because I was I was inspired to reach out to you because you wrote this fabulous piece uh, about the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and we'll discuss that. Um, and then I was digging a little bit deeper. You wrote an all an equally uh, provocative piece about about this latest budget fiasco, the one the budget fiasco to end budget fiascos. But but I want to have fun They're first. They're all the one to end the fiasco. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I want to have fun first, and I. The reason I liked your piece is that you you actually maybe you didn't intend to do this, but you're you're kind of rehabilitating um, Ayn Rand's um, notion of selfishness, and I've, I've I've been sort of obsessed about this the last couple of years because she she has become this this very divisive figure, and and perhaps she always was, but but the idea that you would be true to yourself, the idea that you would work hard for something that you really wanted the idea of artistic integrity these are these are things that i would think would be quintessentially american but like just human values that that people should celebrate and you found that in the marvelous mrs mazel yeah, I think that's I think that's what I was trying to do. I hope maybe you've inter- I've interpreted a show. Maybe you've interpreted a bit of, of what I was trying to do there in uh, in that interpretation. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, so I, I will start off by saying I'm not an objectivist. I don't claim to like have uh, that detailed of scholarly knowledge on, on Ayn Rand or her ideas. But of course, I've read The Fountainhead and I've read Atlas Shrugged and I've read some of her other works as well. Um, and like a lot of people, when I first read them, I was blown away by these ideas. And as I've gotten older, I've, I think I've come to synthesize some of those ideas uh, along the lines of what you were just saying, actually. Like, I think her uh, view of selfishness as being something more than just me first, me, me, me. I mean, it's that, too, to some extent. But it's really an I- it's, this, it's the idea of knowing yourself well and, and not sacrificing what is important to you uh, for, for other people or for other virtues that are, that are less significant than yourself, that obviously the individual comes first. Um, and I saw a lot of that in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I thought that was pretty apparent actually in the early bits of the show too, um, where after, you know, for people who haven't seen the show after she has her- Spo- uh, Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. We're, we're <laughs> we're not, we're in not the gonna, very beginning. Yeah, she, we're not uh, gonna protect anybody. If you, if you haven't watched it, it's your own damn fault and you right. should watch it after you watch this show. I mean, from the very beginning, as soon as her marriage falls apart, which is sort of the inciting incident of the whole uh, story, um, she really does sort of try to claim back her identity and try to figure out, you know, who she really is. And she finds it through comedy. Um, but especially, I thought, in the last season, the one that just wrapped up, um, they really leaned hard into this, into this, uh, the idea of, of her as a very selfish character um, in ways that are both good and bad. I think it's both her, like, fundamental trait and also kind of a flaw. Yeah. Uh, and the show is, is honest about that. And I, I don't think it holds back either way. Yeah, and... And I always sort of deconstruct the phrase because I, I think in the American t- context, for sure, the word selfish means I will do anything to anybody to get what I want. But I think in the way that, that Rand was trying to use it, it's literally self. And and it, it sort of should be obvious to all of us that, that we are individuals. And any beautiful thing we do together is still based on individuals coming together and collaborating and cooperating. And you can't have a community without strong individuals. And, and that, that, to me, is the basis of, of what I got out of her. And maybe that's synthesizing something or not. I mm-hmm. don't know. Um, but, but the other piece, and this, like, I've, I've been obsessed about this, this show from that first season, particularly with the interdict, interdict, introduction of Lenny Bruce. So I did a I did a, a re deep dive on Lenny Bruce and and his whole um, history as sort of this iconic disruptive comedian who who broke down barriers and and literally destroyed himself in the process. Um, we're at, at this point again where comedy is 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 being censored and is is being um, also wildly disruptive of people that would want to censor it. And it all sort of started with Lenny Bruce, and they and they, they followed that storyline throughout Mrs. Maisel. Yeah, I thought that was one of the most fantastic parts of the show. Uh, the guy who plays is it Luke? Uh, oh man, I should know the name, but Luke. Uh, 
uh, whoever it is that plays Lenny Bruce, he won an Emmy for that portrayal in the show, and it's uh, it's really fantastic. I mean, he does just a spot-on job. It was originally a character that I think was created just for the pilot episode. It was just going to be a little throwaway, like, in-joke. Um, and then, you know, he was so good, and their chemistry was so good, they decided to keep the character around. And it's really vital, I think, to the story that is told there, is, is you're also seeing the story of Lenny Bruce, and you're seeing, uh, particularly in the final episode, again, spoilers for people who haven't seen it, but I thought they did a great job of showing the way in which it was really like it's bad laws and bad policy that kind of destroy him. You know, we do see in the final episode him doing what was uh, basically in, in real life. This was one of his final performances in San Francisco in 1965, just before he uh, died of a drug overdose and uh, where he was just sort of ranting and raving and going through his own criminal history. Yeah. Um, and it's you know, it's not very funny, obviously. It's yeah. not a very good comedy performance, but it does do, a, I think, a great job of showing how this character who over the course of four seasons, you saw as a tour de force of a comedian and a character that our hero in the show really is, is aspiring to kind of live up to and uh, and and who is also pushing her along and then you saw how he was destroyed by the by the bad decisions really by fall by poor government policy that tried to censor uh tried to censor what he could say on stage in comedy clubs total total sidebar but relevant uh jim caruso the ceo of flying dog who has spoken at a number of recent events i think that's where i first met him um he actually produced a special beer with Lenny Bruce's face on it for a, a First Amendment. I still have one of those in my fridge. I got yeah. a few of those, and there's still one uh, sitting back there that I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, I, I think I may as well, and um, um, maybe the beer will age, but the but the principle, I think, will age <laughs> well. But uh, that final show that Lenny Bruce did, I think, was with uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers, yeah. which is another favorite of mine, the first reason piece I ever wrote was about Frank Zappa. So we're, we're doing a deep dive here. But but back to the comedy thing. I think that the, the thing that's happening today, so we're in this sort of cancel culture mode where, where people aren't allowed to say certain certain things. And I, I sort of, a little bit of hyperbole, but I think comedians might actually save us from ourselves because they're still allowed, usually, to say things that make us uncomfortable. And it was, it was John Cleese that sort of made this point, like things that make us anxious, the laughter is the release. And that, that sort of freezes up to, to then go to the bar and mm. argue about something that's um, trans rights, something that's really controversial. Yeah. Um, you can then take it to the bar and, and hopefully work it out because someone said it first. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's probably true. And that might be the bridge over where we are right now. Yeah, and I think that's right. And I think you see with Bruce, you see him being transgressive of not just of cultural and social norms, but of like legal norms, right? In his time, um, challenging those things. And uh, and that's obviously central to the show as well. And then, uh, you know, comedy evolves, social norms evolve. Luckily, we've kind of left those obscenity laws in the past. We no longer have to worry about, as bad as cancel culture is, we no longer have to worry about people being hauled off to jail because they tell a bad joke. Yeah. Um, but bringing, like, I think there is something that's, I, I recently was at a comedy show, actually. There's a comedy club here in D.C. that helped launch the career of Dave Chappelle and a number of other big-time comedians um, recently had its 40th anniversary, and I went to it, a big stand-up special. They had a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of the alums come back, people who had worked on Chappelle's show back in the day. He wasn't actually there, even though we were kind of hoping he would show up. Um, and it and it's, a, a, you know, it's, it's a forum in which they, right at the beginning, tell you, you know, look, nobody record this. Nobody, like, we're going to say things that are going to get us canceled here tonight. Like, we're trusting everybody in the audience. Like, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of the, the MCs throughout the whole thing as they're bringing more people on are sort of reminding the audience this and it was it was like a, a different kind of experience because it does then feel like you're also transgressing right yeah. it's like it's like including the audience in this moment um in a way that i thought was really cool and uh, this happened at the 9 30 club it wasn't like in an underground comedy cellar basement show or anything but it felt that way for a minute right it felt like oh here's you know we're all doing something we shouldn't be doing right we're telling jokes um, and so the, the, yeah, the current moment is not necessarily good in a lot of ways on this front, but there is like, they, you do get that little kick of like subversion from, uh, from just participating in it. And so that's great. So like go out and see live comedy, go see stand up shows. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's one thing you can do to help the culture. If you're watching this show, you're probably wondering, is there a way I can support Liberty and improve my life at the same time? Well, there is. Pack Crest Botanicals is a libertarian-owned company that makes botanical CBD products. I started using CBD oil to help me when I'm trying to sleep, and my three annoying cats won't leave me alone. 
Now I can just ignore them for a solid eight hours and wake up feeling great. Not only are they run by our friends in the Liberty Movement, Pack Crest Botanicals also uses high quality organic ingredients in everything they make. They sell tinctures, edibles, topicals, and botanical vapes. CBD oil can help with pain, insomnia, inflammation, anxiety, stress, arthritis, and more. Use discount code FREETHEPEOPLE to save 25% of your order. And if you select Free the People as your charitable organization at checkout, a portion of your purchase will be donated to us to help fight for freedom. Yeah, yeah, Joe Rogan has opened his new club in Austin, and I think he, he did it specifically because he wanted to have a home for comedians who might otherwise be canceled or yeah. or not not allowed to perform in other places, particularly college campuses, which are so hostile right now. Yeah. And it, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with the fact that, that Joe Rogan started off, as I remember the history, was just talking to his buddy comedians. Yeah. And they were just shooting the shit, and um, you know sometimes comedians obviously they get into very controversial political, cultural things, and he is now um, the most trusted figure in news. I don't think he would say it that way, but um, people like him because it's not propaganda. Whatever it is, it's not propaganda. He's yeah. just having honest conversations, and to this day, I think the. The comedy episodes are by far the the best performing. Yeah, and I think it's always it's going to be different today because everything you know, even his show is is online, right? And it's broadcast. Everybody can access it with their phone. That's obviously worlds away from like the 1950s, early 1960s, and the Gaslight Cafe in the Village yeah. in New York, right? Like it's just the dynamics are all so different. Um, but there are these, yeah, there are these common themes and sort of this element of of free speech and this element of uh, of wanting to just like say the thing that you can't say. And I think that's always you know, like whatever whatever comes. Next, Next, that's always going to be with us in the culture, you know. I, I hope at least. I think that's the quintessentially American thing yeah. to, uh, you know, to to Maisel and and Bruce's time period, and it and it carries through to today in a different way. So you guys, the reason guys were were kind of um, first generation. We're gonna we're gonna do cultural stuff and even comedy stuff to 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 introduce people to some of these libertarian ideas. Um, do do you know when the first comedy thing hit that's been a it's been years now like at reason you mean yeah, reason yeah. tv no i don't know i know they've been doing it for yeah for as long as i've been aware of reason um and i should know probably the when that started up uh but uh, that's been sort of fundamental to reason tv and even before there was reason tv that was fundamental you know we yeah. had peter bag in the magazine you know going back decades um and there's always been kind of that uh, that aesthetic i think to reason in the, the print product that we put out and i hope on the web too um but certainly in the print product there's been that aesthetic uh brian darty one of our you know senior editors just published a book on uh, dirty comics basically on like uh, this is now not not comics stand-up comics but drawn comics uh you know jokes and things like that oh, that could only be okay. printed by certain publishers that were basically shunned by yeah. uh you know they weren't in the not comic strips that were not in your newspapers but ones that you could find in other places uh over the decades so, yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of that overlap uh, with libertarianism for sure yeah. in uh, just the sense of like, yeah, if somebody's saying you can't publish something or say something, even if they're not, if it's not legal, even if it's just a, a cultural norm, uh, I think there's always going to be a little sense of like, well, libertarians, well, you know, we, we want to do that anyway. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, you guys started in the analog world of, yeah. of literally printing magazines we still and, do. And, and trying to distribute them and, and. You know, fast forward to this dynamic you're d describing with Rogan. We're not in tiny little clubs in in basements in Lower Manhattan now. Right. We're not just printing magazines. We have this amplification um, of of social media and and all of these techniques. I mean, this was the inspiration for Terry and I to start Free the People six years ago because we thought we can reach a really broad audience, yeah. but we're not going to reach it with a policy paper. We're not going to reach it with with politics per se, we have to we have to engage people with with stories, and now we're we're producing comedy as well, because again, I think that's the that's the cutting edge of yeah. of how to engage people. Which I, I wonder. I, I was I, I did a little bit of research on this, and maybe you know, but I, I see no indication that the showrunners for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel are objectivists or have yeah. even read the books. But but that you know that that final monologue is just spot on. I was thinking about that too, um, actually, as I was writing the piece, and then as I was preparing to come on here, 
Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, I know a little bit about uh, Amy Sherman Pellegrino and her husband, Daniel Pellegrino, who are the two showrunners there. Um, they're also the people who are behind Gilmore Girls. I'm far, far from an expert on that. You could find any millennial female in D.C. who could probably bring you, uh, tell you more about that show. But there's certainly uh, similar dynamics in those two they shows. They should go all the way back to Roseanne, according yeah, to Wikipedia. Yeah, sure, there you yeah. go. Right, right. It's like sort of looking at fam- family dynamics and the ways sort of the sins of the parents are visited upon the children. That sort of comes up over and over again. But yeah, I don't really get the sense that they were objectivist. I think I'm probably interpreting a little bit here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think... I think there's actually you can't set a, a television show in New York in the late 1950s and early 1960s and have it be about people who are exploring the boundaries of culture in that era without it being a little bit libertarian. Right. I yeah. mean, at, at some point. So, again, spoilers. This isn't really a spoiler, but uh, Midge Maisel's father, Abe, he kind of goes on this sort of philosophical adventure, kind of meanders through a couple seasons. Um, and it's just sort of funny sideshow uh, part of the story. But like I kept hoping maybe he's just going to run into Rothbard somewhere like yeah. because there are real people. It's not just Lenny Bruce. There are other like real characters that they brought into the show uh, or real people that they brought into the show as characters. And like this is all happening in the same time and place, right? Like Rothbard's meetings are happening in New York right around that same time. Ayn Rand has her little circle uh, uh, also in Manhattan, you know, discussing the, these philosophical the ideas. The Ludwig von Mises so, lectures. Absolutely. So like this was Now that's just, what I wanted to see. I want to see. Right. Why, I mean, why couldn't that be in there? But, uh, you know, this was you can't. I think so that that is sort of fundamental to the ethos of that environment that yeah. they set the show. Uh, so I don't think I'm stretching too much to read these things into it, but well, in a lot of ways, um, I might be disappointed if I discovered that they were they were like closeted uh, fans of Atlas Shrugged, <laughs> because I like Maybe. to I like to believe that these libertarian principles, you know, the the, the dignity of of the pursuit of of your dream, like that that is a very libertarian thing. But I think it's it's broader than that. I think, um, and so so when I see a popular show. That's amplifying that stuff without self-consciously being libertarian. I, I feel yeah. like that's a that's a bigger story in some ways. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, this is not a libertarian show, and like uh, you know, Mrs. Maisel, Midge Maisel is not a necessarily a libertarian hero. She's uh, you know, she's a woman who is and as an individual who like sort of takes charge of her own life and determines that she's going to succeed. And I think really importantly, this is a point I made in the piece that I, that I want to make here. Like really importantly, wants to succeed on her own terms because we're shown throughout the show these other characters that are very successful in show business. Kind of each season introduces one major major success story and then over the course of the season kind of deconstructs that person and by the end we find out that they're very flawed or that they've sold out something fundamental to themselves um, and it starts with the one comedian that she sort of uh, is you know following and, and trying to you know get to know better uh, Sophie Lennon is the character's name and uh, it turns out that this comedian who plays a sort of like Jackie Gleason but like a female version of that like this working class from Queens persona with like a big accent and all of that and it turns out she's like an upper crust socialite who lives in Manhattan and as a butler and she's obviously just putting on an act and then that same theme kind of repeats itself over and over again through each of the subsequent seasons um and this is like midge is really put off by that uh mazel the main character and she decides that like she's not going to do that she's not going to sell out what it is about herself and in her own personal story which is where she finds her humor um, and again, I think that's like a really libertarian theme, it, maybe not explicitly so, but the idea that I'm not going to subvert myself uh, f- to find success. I'm going to find success anyway, but yeah. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah, you compare her to Howard Rourke. Yeah. And and I always, I always gave Howard Rourke a little bit of credit for, at least in my mind, not selling out in Washington, D.C., yeah. because he taught me how to say no. And mm-hmm. there's there's always an opportunity to make more money and get higher position, and have really important friends in high places in Washington D.C. If you're willing to say yes to just that little but fundamental compromise on something really important, and he's the one that like he you know famously walks away from mm-hmm. from school. He famously walks away from all the big architecture jobs, all the big firms, and he eventually gets there, as does. Mitch Maisel when she says, I'm not going to open for anybody because I want to control my own career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think we also get uh, some other like sort of uh, Randy and stock characters too. Like her husband is sort of an Eddie Willers character. If you think mm-hmm. about it, a colleague of mine pointed this out today that like he is the one who wants to be a comedian at the beginning, right? But he's not funny. But yeah. so what he does is he ends up like put a, sort of putting his life in service of the person who is funny, right? Of yeah. the kind of uber mensch character in the show. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you do sort of see some of that pop up in, in other 
other ways. Um, yeah, and then and then it all comes home in the finale in the that speech that she gives her the the sort of stand up routine that she kind of like just commandeers a microphone in the middle of what's supposed to be an interview and uh, says she's gonna you know do her do her act here for four minutes and it does culminate in I think a really good like thesis statement for her character and for the show in general where she says that like I want a big life and I'm gonna break the rules and I'm gonna do these things and uh, and you know nobody's gonna uh, effectively sort of reinstate their uh, restates the famous Howard Rourke line of like, yeah. who's going to stop me. And then we see through the flash forward devices that they used in the final season, we see that by and large, she succeeds. Uh, she's alienated from her children. She's alienated from some other people, uh, but she accomplishes the thing she set out to do. Have you ever thought about using CBD oil? You haven't? Well, think about it now. Are you thinking about it? Good, because now there's a way to support freedom and improve your life at the same time. Petcrest Botanicals is a libertarian-owned company that makes a wide variety of botanical CBD products. I use CBD oil to soothe the sore muscles I get from constantly fighting the man here in Washington, D.C. It's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. Petcrest Botanicals uses high-quality organic ingredients in everything they make. And as libertarians, you won't have to worry about them hurting people or taking their stuff. They sell tinctures, edibles, topicals, and botanical vapes. CBD oil can help with pain, insomnia, inflammation, anxiety, stress, arthritis, and more. Use the discount code FREETHEPEOPLE to save 25% of your order, and if you select Free the People as your charitable organization at checkout, a portion of your purchase will be donated to help us keep fighting for freedom. Okay, hard pivot. <laughs> Who is going to stop the fiscal insanity in Ooh, Washington D.C.? Because you already we were joking before we went live. Like, how are we going to go from Mrs. Maisel to yeah. the latest crap sandwich that that came out of uh, the budget process in Washington D.C.? And you wrote, you wrote, I thought a, a pretty um, thought provoking piece on that as well as they were going through this latest train wreck because it's it's been like a. 30-year slow-motion train wreck. Like, everyone knows where we're going. Yep. Everyone knows what we need to do to stop it, but that doesn't seem to be able to stop. There's some sort of good observational funny bit like a, a Mrs. Maisel could make about the way things go in D.C., I'm sure, after the observations that we've had over the last few decades. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's you know, it, this is the first, I think, of a number of critical decisions that are coming in the next few years. Um, I actually wrote a piece, I'm going to go back a little bit, but I wrote a piece right before COVID hit in January of 2020, uh, in which I said the 2020s were going to be the decade of deficit doomsday, because there were all these sorts of looming things. We have to finally deal with Social Security. We have to finally deal with Medicare, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, the, just the, the amount of spending that we had built up during a decade that was pretty good. Uh, the amount of deficits we had built up during the 2010s uh, was now you know going to be challenged if there were any difficulties on the horizon. Lo and behold, there were some difficulties on the yeah. horizon yeah um yeah so it's very i you know I, I don't know i think the immediate thing is that the policymakers in dc need to think about just stabilizing the debt which is really kind of the scary bit is like when you talk to people who are uh seriously like in the numbers on this uh you know the first thing is we just have to get it so that we're not adding to it at an ever faster rate yeah uh you know balancing the budget decreasing the debt is almost like that's that's you can't even begin to think about those things um but this is this is the beginning of what's going to be a serious number of really important decisions coming up, uh, and I don't see any political willpower to do anything about it. Partisans on Twitter got mad at me because I, I pointed out that that a lot of these structural problems uh, more recently were caused by the Trump administration mm -hmm. with their with their first budget deal in twenty one. I think it was. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, where they. Um, and Trump was never, he, he never pretended to be a debt hawk or a fiscal conservative or anything else. So it's not like, um, it's not like we got something that we didn't, didn't deserve, but, but he stripped away those, those caps on domestic, uh, discretionary spending yep. and defense spending that, that were like the one lasting legacy of, of the Tea Party budget wars going all the way back to 2013. So he kind of signaled to both Republicans and Democrats, you know, it, you just ate a large meal and you could you could work out tomorrow and get yourself in shape but <laughs> just unbuckle your pants and just 
just it's dig fine. back in. Let's, let's feed. Have another course. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think obviously on the numbers, lifting the caps is significant and, and the increases in budgets that happened under Trump, um, you know, are just as bad as the increases in budgets that happened under Bush and Obama and Biden. Um, also, but I think the, the cultural shift there is an important one. And maybe cultural is the wrong word, but the the sort of the, the political uh, perspective, particularly from the left. And what I mean by that is that for a long time, I think there was this suspicion on the left that the Tea Party year had all the Tea Party uh, budget years and the, and the sequestration and the budget caps were all just a cynical game that were, Republicans were playing because there was a Democrat in the White House. And I think some of that was actually sincere during the Tea Party years. I don't think the left was was right to view it that way. But then as soon as Republicans had full control of Congress again and the White House under Trump, well, there go the budget caps. Yeah, yeah. There goes spending through the roof again. Right. And so I think that really reinforced this idea Right or wrong, it at least convinced the left that, uh, well, any time Republicans talk about fiscal responsibility, it's just a cynical ploy yeah. to stop us from doing the things we want to do. So we should stop listening to that. We should stop even trying to play games with with, uh, with any of this, stop negotiating with it. Um, and I think that informs the way Biden approached this deadline, where Biden just said for a long time, I'm not even going to negotiate. And of course, eventually you have to negotiate because we can't go you know, over the fiscal cliff. But uh, you know, for, for a long time, I think you saw that. And I think now you know, that table remains set for the next deal. And it's going it's to be the same situation. The Democrats feel like they don't have to give in because they think fiscal responsibility is just a, you know, it's just a political game. Yeah. Well, I, there, there's definitely some truth to it, but it, I think something shifted because I, I view the, the Tea Party budget wars as something that was pushed from the outside. So you had you had the true believers, you had the the Amashas and the Masseys and the, the Mike Lees and the Rand Pauls that that absolutely I, I think are credibly could argue are fiscal conservatives and have fought Republicans as much as they fought Democrats. But but the Freedom House Freedom Caucus, which was born in the Tea Party years and their one issue was cut cap and balance, and we're gonna we're gonna rein in spending. They kind of took a powder during the Trump years. Mm-hmm. Um, either they were defeated by Trumpism, or they were just partisan about it. So, yep. so one of, one of my measures of whether or not someone actually is a fiscal conservative, Republican, Democrat, or otherwise, is are you willing to criticize your own party yep. and stick your neck on the line? And I think I think that's what's different. There's there's not much of that left, yep. and it's um, it's now like you you said. Culturally, I think, I think um, pretend fiscal conservatives for political purposes on both sides. But they, you know, there used to be blue dog Democrats, mm-hmm. and there were fiscally um, responsible Republicans who who preceded the Tea Party movement. That whole culture has been replaced by, you know, what um, if we're going to spend two trillion dollars every year, we have a a, 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 a crisis and and Massey. In, in his defense, argues that the CARES Act was sort of that tipping point where mm-hmm. uh, people didn't even want to vote on that. It's, it's, it was huge. And yeah. and since then, it's just been off the rails. Yeah, and I think you look at the way the, the baseline of spending jumped during COVID. So even if, even when you take out the emergency spending, which was the, you know, the CARES Act and the other one-time bills, the baseline spending jumped by like one and a half trillion dollars. Like that's just the, the you know, the, the baseline level that we're using as we project all these, all these things going forward. Um, and that's what, you know, there was an attempt here with the debt ceiling deal, not to roll back all of that, obviously, but to roll back the last bit of that, which was the $1.7 trillion passed as part of the omnibus bill last December, uh, which was all discretionary and defense spending uh, increases. And, uh, you know, that was the I think that was the one thing that this group of, of fiscal conservatives in the House had really latched onto was like, let's at least roll back to 2022 spending. Right. And yeah. if you can't even go back one year, you can't even cut government back to what it spent last year. Um, you know, I don't know what the hope is for for, you know, seriously dealing with something like the Social Security, which is going to run a, you know, a, a, tens of trillions of dollar deficit uh, in the next decade. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it, it's going to take yeah, I, it may take an actual serious crisis, um, but we're going to need I think we are going to need like an infusion of new blood from the outside again in D.C. to push some of these things forward, because, yeah, to your point, like there's just not enough of that. And if, if you're looking to the left, if you're saying like, oh, well, maybe there'll be some blue dog Democrats after the next election or something, right? Like that's, you know, <laughs> really, really desperate times. They, man. they, they don't, <laughs> that's where they at, don't yeah. exist anymore. Right. And, and there's 
we, that that would be a whole different conversation. And that's, that's just like right, like gerrymandering yeah. has contributed to that. The, the left's whole political, yeah. you know, evolution has contributed to that. So yeah, I don't think they're coming back. But Joe I, Mansion, I, though, we got Joe Mansion. Yeah, we that's got it. Joe Mansion, <laughs> who's who's strong until yeah he gets something for West Virginia. That's what he wants. Yeah, what's that pipeline? But but my um, my theory on this, I, I wonder what you think, and this goes back to the Tea Party Wars. It was those caps on defense spending that were intolerable for Republicans mm-hmm. because. Because the war on terror and the never-ending wars and and fully funding the military is a black hole that no amount of money could ever fill. So as long as um, um, uh, the majority of Republicans are are kind of neocon, we have to keep spending and spending and spending on this. The Lindsey Graham wing of the Republican Party there's no way that Republicans, as as a governing group, can be fiscally conservative as long as that's one of the tenets of their world. Yeah, and you see that in this deal that was struck here too, right? I mean, it was only discretionary spending caps going forward for two years. That's the that's the thing the Republicans got out of this deal, uh, which is nothing. Like discretionary spending is basically flat anyway. Uh, it has been for for years now, and has continued. You know, the the projections we have suggest that it will continue to be in the future. All the spending growth, all the deficit growth is entitlements, health care and defense uh, and interest on the national debt, which is, you know, just a function of all this other stuff. Um, and so you can't. Yeah. I mean, you can't seriously grapple with the deficit problem. You can't seriously grapple with the debt that's accumulated until you look at those things. And Republicans uh, at this point aren't even happy to really talk about entitlements. I think typically you would have said that Republicans maybe would say, all right, well, let's tackle entitlements and leave uh, defense, yeah. leave the military spending alone. Uh, that's not even true anymore because I think a lot of, of top Republicans from Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, a lot of the, the sort of new right have said we can't touch Social Security. That's, you know, yeah. that's now a, a complete uh, that's off the table completely. So it's that. And then and then, yeah, right. If you can't even if you can't look at the Pentagon and say, wait a minute, maybe you guys shouldn't get an increase. In, not not even cuts. So let's just say you can't get an increase until you can pass an audit. Right. You know, until we find out where all the money we spent in Afghanistan went. Uh, you know, it's just completely unserious. And so, again, this this also feeds back to what we talked about before, that, like, I think it just reinforces the idea that Republicans use this claim of fiscal responsibility as a as a cudgel against the left, as a way to just sort of throw up roadblocks to things the left wants to do. But they're not actually serious about it, yeah. because if you were serious about it, you have to look at the Pentagon and yeah. you have to say we can't keep increasing defense spending like this. And, and by the way, there's fewer and fewer Democrats that want yeah, to look at the Pentagon. True. And I there used to be this, you know, when, when you were in grade school, you learned about um, public finance, that there was a trade-off between guns and butter, and <laughs> and the Democrats supposedly wanted more domestic spending, the right. butter, and, and conservative Republicans wanted more um, military spending, and they would, they would fight it out, and they would split the difference. Um, but now it's like, yes, and, and we're doing all the defense and all the domestic and pretty much everything. Yeah, so, and you might have a fight over like like SNAP benefits, which right. was the fight here, right? It's yeah. just like, well, well, we'll change some of the work requirements to actually end up spending more money, as it turns out, as the CBO says that the, that we probably will. But uh, that's you know that's that's pennies on the on the penny on the dollar of what we're spending elsewhere. I think the changes that they implemented, something like two billion dollars over ten years, is what the CBO projects the difference to be. That's you know that's yeah. nothing in the federal budget. So let's let's talk. I've I've wanted to talk about this, um, and I don't I don't have a strong answer myself. You might have an opinion, but you you mentioned the fact that that Thomas Massey, um, by far one of the most consistent fiscal hawks in the House or the Senate for that matter, um, ended up voting for this yeah. deal, and he's taken a lot of crap for it. Um, but his point was that um, you know I've. I've tried almost everything. I actually led a coup against the Speaker of the House, and the guy that we replaced him with turned out to be worse in terms of, of, of managing the stuff. Mm-hmm. He's, he's led um, shutdown efforts. He was the one guy that demanded that Congress come back to Washington, D.C. to vote on the CARES Act. I don't, I don't feel like his credentials as a fiscal conservative are in question here, yeah. but he's, he was at odds with other people that I very much respect, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, again, Tea Party class guys that have been fighting these fights this entire time. Did Massey have a point or did he finally throw up his hands and give up? I think Massey had a point. I think I maybe disagree with some of his point. But uh, so, yeah, I don't have a hot take, I guess is what I'm saying. But I think what, you know, the first thing he said in that explanation, that Twitter thread was that this is one of the only bills I've ever voted for. Maybe he said the only bill I've ever voted for that has actually cut spending. 
And so, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's really the root of his argument is like, I'm here to cut spending and this bill did it. Maybe I would have liked to have seen it do more. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I'm interpreting again, but I think yeah. that's what he meant there. Um, he's also, you know, he's worked himself into an important position on the rules committee, right? Like he's able, he's put himself into a position to have real influence on things. And this is yeah, unfortunately the game that you have to play in Washington sometimes is like if if you blow up that deal uh, by voting no on it, does that does that jeopardize your ability to have that influence later on an, on another thing? Um, and yeah, I, there are no good answers to this, right? Unfortunately, know, this yeah. is the game of politics. But, uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate, I will say that I really appreciate his explanation. I think that's really important. I wish all of our lawmakers gave the sort of explanation that he gave on that vote. Um, I, th you know, yeah, I think I don't think it was a good deal. But I also don't really have a great idea of what the alternative might have been um, yeah. at, the, at that point, at the point that it had been negotiated by the by, you know, Biden and McCarthy. Um, I think that the time to get a better deal was earlier in the process was yeah. for the, the two people who were basically negotiating it to do it better. And then I think the other thing Massey said, and this goes back to having influence over uh, over what comes next, is that, you know, the, the real the real fight here is not over the debt ceiling. The real fight is over budget negotiations, right? The debt ceiling is just really making the credit card payment or, or like taking out another loan to pay your credit card payment is really the better metaphor. Uh, but it's really that. It has nothing to do with how much you're actually spending. And so what we what we really need is is Republicans in particular, but all members of all parties to uh, say that, well, we're spending too much. And so the, the influence that, that he could have, the influence that other people uh, like him could have in Congress over over budget deals going forward is probably more important than any leverage over this debt ceiling deal. Yeah. And he's also making the point that I would call it Justin a mosh point, although yeah. Justin very much disagreed, Actually with, disagreed him with him yeah, right. on this. But mm. but for, for years, um, while he was in Congress and since he left Congress, Amash was like, we need to get back to a, a normal, yep. transparent budget process. We need to pass appropriations bills and those we need to be allowed to offer amendments and all of that stuff. And that, that was a big part of what Massey and other people forced McCarthy to agree to when he squeaked by as the, as the new speaker. And, and that is absolutely true. So I think, I think we have to wait and see if anything resembling a normal budget process actually happens and whether or not it matters. And um, I, I think that's really the whole game, right? Like we have to get back to having an actual appropriations process that works. There's, you know, the, the government I mean, the government never really works, but the like the budget part, the process of government works if you let it. Like yeah. this is this is tried and tested, and we've just gotten away from it. But it worked for two hundred years, yeah. uh, various you know iterations of it. But uh, you know, I think that if you were able to have an actual budget process, have what is it, twelve appropriations bills that come through every year, and let each of them go through their appropriate committees and be marked up, and have the scrutiny applied to like what is what government you know what is this program doing? What are we spending it on? You know, how is this money being spent? Uh, that would get us along way towards uh, towards dealing with some of these questions. Although, again, there, we're only talking about discretionary spending and defense spending with that yeah. process. We're not talking about entitlements there either. So that's, uh, you know, it only gets you half the way there. Yeah. But I think Massey, uh, again, I'm interpreting here, I think he would like to see one year of that process play out because you're right, they did get this deal in January as part of uh, McCarthy's speakership election. And, uh, you know, it, it would be a shame to throw that possibility away on a debt ceiling deal that was, you know, I think was basically a done deal anyway, regardless of which way he'd voted. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, um, I, I suspect I would have been team blow it up if I was forced to vote on this. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of, after so many years of fighting the budget, I'm kind of a conscientious objector because every single thing that we tried, starting with cut cap and balance and in 2011, I guess, is when we started those fights and we we shut down the government multiple times, and everybody was demonizing us. And um, and and then we then we went after the speaker, and we got rid of Boehner, and then then Paul Ryan was worse. He's he's one of the architects of this massive opaque omnibus thing that Nancy yep. Pelosi just just ran the boards with. Every time we fought, we you know we, maybe we got up to the ten yard line. But then things just got worse. Yeah, and Paul Ryan is the ultimate example of the downside of this approach we talked about a yeah. minute ago, right? Of the, like, well, I have to go along to eventually have the power to do the thing I want to do. Like, he he did that for a long time. He got and he had the power, and then it was, what uh, that, what, what happened? You uh, know? A one, so that's a the one, thing. A one, once upon a time, Atlas Shrugged it's, quoting <laughs> guy that became Speaker of the House, and he, he, he 
failed in we should have seen that going poorly in retrospect though right like all the people in atlas shrugged who have political power are the are the bad guys ultimately so maybe he took the wrong lessons out of that yeah i I think we should leave that there like read atlas shrugged (laughs) and watch mrs Maisel. you have a feature piece coming up in the the imminent uh copy of Reason Magazine. The next issue of the magazine, which I think will be the, uh, I guess it's the August-September issue. It's our double issue. Um, Yeah, we'll do a hard pivot again. This is about uh, trade policy and about the ways in which the Biden administration is kind of slowly laying the groundwork, not even all that slowly, actually, to police American investment dollars going abroad. We already have a mechanism in the government that most people probably don't know about called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Sounds very, like, McCarthyist, right? Uh, not Kevin McCarthy, but the other one. Um, and uh, now the, the Biden it administration a little bit to, Wesley Mouch. To yeah, be it's, with you. Uh, it's a black box. It doesn't even have to report to Congress on what in what it's investigating, what deals it's investigating. Uh, hmm. This is aimed at at policing foreign investment in the United States. It's a thing that was cooked up in the 80s during that now like pretty comical panic over uh, over Japan buying up farmland and companies in the United States. Um, but now uh, the Biden administration is looking to turn around and create basically a duplicate of that organization or that entity uh, that would draw together like the Department of Defense, state, bunch of intelligence agencies and have it police again, totally inside a black box with no due process whatsoever, police how Americans invest their money abroad. Um, all of this, of course, under the guise of, of policing, you know, where we spend money or how we invest money in China. Um, but it'll you know, it could do much more than that. And so I have, yeah, I have a piece looking at some of the, some of what's being said about this and why we should yeah. be talking more about this because it's a terrible idea. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. Is it just me or is it is is every radical expansion in government power now under the guise of either homeland security or national security? It, that's exactly what this piece is about, is about how we're combining the uh, what used to be economic ideas. Now we're rolling them all into national security. Trump did this a lot, you know, with his tariffs that were sort of, they were premised on this like national security justification, which was always very flimsy, but no one challenged or no one seriously challenged. Um, and Biden is just picking up that football and running with it. Now you talk, you know, his uh, national security advisor advisor Jake Sullivan has given now multiple speeches where he has just like openly conflated economic, uh, you know, the United States economic might and the and the private investment that Americans generate with like military strategy and talking yeah. about how cutting that off can weaken our opponents overseas. And that's, uh, you know, that uh, you're starting to put up all sorts of barriers to to investment, which is really the, you know, to go back to Atlas Shrugged, like that's the thing that drives that's the fuel that drives the engine that powers the global economy. And uh, and you're cutting that off or you're or you're putting up, you know, making it more difficult for that to operate. So, uh, yeah, like in summation, watch uh, watch comedy, go do like enjoy stand up comedy because stay out of politics and it's depressing. Yeah, we were having fun and now we're just depressed. Yeah. So the magazine is both uh, published um, old style and is it available online as well? Yeah, of course. Uh, Reason Magazine is we put out 11 issues a year, old style, you know, dead tree print uh, magazine. And it looks wonderful. Please pick it up and subscribe to it and all of that. Uh, but everything we put in the magazine is also on the website. Sometimes you have to wait a little while for it. If you don't have a if you have a subscription, you get it online as soon as the issue goes out. Uh, if you don't have a subscription, you have to wait and everything in the issue kind of gets you know dripped out over the course of the month. Um, but uh, sign-up subscriptions are very reasonable. We'd love to send you a copy of Reason Magazine in your mailbox every month. Cool, and, and how do people find you? Uh, you can find me online, obviously, at reason.com, which is the website for Reason. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, Eric Boehm 87 That's B-O-E-H-M is my last name, number eight, number seven. Um, I'm on there posting about politics and sports and other random thoughts that I have. Cool, thanks for doing this. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.